Welcome to the uh, training module for HAI covering the security functionality. We're going to talk through the couple of options we've got for incorporating an intruder alarm functionality into the HAI system. Security is uh, an interesting one. Um, it uh, certainly has a really good uh, a tight integration with the concept of home automation. If you think about uh, most alarm systems out there have got PIRs and door sensors around the property that uh, really only get used when the alarm system is armed. All day long when the alarm system is not being used all those sensors uh, don't really do much. So with the uh, HAI uh, home automation functionality you've got a great opportunity to use all those sensors to do useful functions for a user. Simple example may be that uh, when the front door opens, of course uh, we know when that happens because there'll be a, a security sensor on the door, a little door catch. So when the door is opened, we know about it. Maybe uh, if it's dark outside, let's turn the porch light on for the customer. Alternatively, um, when, when the customer arms the alarm in away mode, uh, we know that there, there's nobody in the house, we know the house is empty, so we can do some sensible things like turn all the lights off, turn the, secure, turn the audio off, uh, maybe uh, drop the thermostats back to an away temperature. And likewise, when the customer comes home and disarms the alarm, we might set up a scene around the house, both from a lighting and an audio, and bring the temperature back up to normal temperature, uh, cu customize that particular user being as we have different codes for each user, we're able to then set up things differently based on that user disarming the alarm. So there's some really nice things you can do when you incorporate security functions uh, into a home automation solution. First thing we have to kind of get our head around is the options that we have in how we uh, can do security within the HAI system. And some of this, well, a lot of this is driven from some of the UK requirements uh, for alarm systems within the United Kingdom. There's this thing called uh, EN 50131, which is a European directive. Uh, basically, if uh, your customer wants to be able to gain police response in the UK from their intruder alarm system, then firstly the system has to be approved by an installer who is certified through the NSI or the SSAIB. Uh, these are two independent bodies which ensure the installer is doing things correctly. Uh, used to be the old NACOS uh, approvals but that's long since gone. Uh, it's now either NSI or SSAIB are the two bodies you as an installation company can become approved by in order to uh, approve alarm installations for police response. If you are wishing to do that, then you need to install equipment that uh, is compliant with this uh, uh, European directive EN 50131. Uh, then, as an installer, you can then apply for a URN, which is a unique reference number. Uh, that then allows a third-party monitoring company to then call the police in the situation where your intruder alarm goes off. Uh, so it's pretty rigorous um, to become NSI or SSIB approved. You do need to be inspected and they will uh, look at your procedures and processes and how you how you uh, conduct yourself operationally as well as the quality of the installation. And if the police do have several false alarms, then you can have your ability to obtain a URN revoked. So it's all about reducing the amount of false call outs because obviously these things cost money. With the HAI system, uh, we have uh, two options which are shown at the moment here in front of you. Uh, the Omni range of controllers, uh, shown on the left hand side, do have the intruder alarm functionality built into the controller. On the right hand side, I'm showing the Lumina controller from HAI connected to an external uh, alarm box shown on the right hand side. The 
uh, right hand uh, option is NSI or SSAIB approvable to get a URN for police response. The left hand diagram isn't. The one of the uh, um, requirements of EN 50131 is that you cannot download configuration to the alarm which will change its behavior in in the way it operates that's really there to protect end users from perhaps an unscrupulous installer that uh, might change behavior so they can come back and get in via the back door at a weekend of some form um, the idea with uh, with 50131 requires that the only person who can change the behavior of an alarm system is actually the manufacturer being as our HAI control platform is a home automation system and as you've hopefully gleaned from the in, from the previous modules that uh, one of its values is being able to configure it and program it to do intelligent things so unfortunately being able to program the system as a home automation system is directly orthogonal to one of the directives in EN 50131 so we cannot make the uh, Omni system compliant to that European directive that's why we put together the option shown on the right hand side of the page where we've basically broken all the alarm functionality out of the main HAI control platform and we've in incorporated it into its own self-contained unit and that unit is compliant to 50131 uh, which can be approved by an NSI or SSAIB installer the two then link together via an RS-232 cable this allows us to arm the alarm, disarm the alarm, trigger off of PIRs or door sensors that um, are triggered via activities in the house and be able to trigger automation functions similar to what I described uh, at the beginning. Uh, so really from a user perspective, these two architectures are identical. From a user point of view, from the iPad app or the Android app or the touch screen, the user sees a seamless system able to perform all functions. Uh, but back in the equipment room, we've broken the alarm functionality out, in, uh, functionality out into a separate standalone piece of hardware that allows us to achieve compliance with the European directives. So the right hand solution is a brilliant solution uh, in order to comply with those directives and then if you are a NSI or SSI approved alarm installation company or you can buddy up and subcontract the alarm installation out to uh, an NSI or SSAIB approved company then you can achieve those goals. And indeed the right hand diagram is quite nice logistically because it makes provides a very clean demarcation that if you subcontract out the alarm work to your NSI or SSAIB approved alarm buddy um, then there's a nice clean demarcation the alarm company fits the alarm security box and um, and then you can fit the controller and the audio and the lighting and do all the programming and that kind of stuff so that actually works very well from a, a logistical point of view for installers who are not NSI or SSAIB approved. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the left hand diagram, it's not illegal um, or anything inappropriate to install the uh, Omni based uh, alarm intruder system. Um, however, you won't be able to get police response. You can have the system call you up and dial up uh, up to eight phone numbers to let you know the alarm's going off. Um, and we have um, uh, approval with the Omni range of products for third party monitoring by Group 4 Security and they indeed can call key holders uh, to let them know the alarm's going off and they have their own private security force that can attend site uh, in, a, in that scenario uh, but obviously for a fee. The, uh, but you can't get police response. Um, so you've got to weigh up what's the right solution for the customer, and what's the right implementation. Um, in many scenarios with uh, perhaps more affluent clients that their insurance require them to have an NSI or SSAIB approved alarm installation, then you'll be on the right hand chart. For, um, <coughs> for the purpose of the rest of this module, we are going to be talking about the left hand architecture using the Omni and going through the intruder alarm functionality of the Omni system uh, and there will be a separate 
on a uh, separate online module on this website for the right hand uh, system so I'm going to move on to uh, to that right now wiring in PIRs this is um, relatively straightforward and industry standard most PIR uh, sensors have six terminals shown uh, uh, on the diagram you've got 12 volt power plus and minus at the far left hand two scroll down terminal blocks they require permanent power the Omni uh, panels, the, the light, the 2E and the Pro all provide 12 volts off of the auxiliary output shown in the upper layer of screw down terminal box. So you can get your 12 volt power from there via a two core cable. On the actual PIR, we've got alarm contact and we've got tamper. These things are generally open circuit when everything's fine and closed circuit when I've got a problem. Um, so if it's a motion sensor, when I detect motion, the alarm contacts will go closed circuit. We've also got two, two connections for tamper. Underneath the PIR cover, there's a micro switch. So when you pull the cover off uh, and also a micro switch behind the PIR, so if you yank it off the wall, then again, the tamper is normally open for okay and closed circuit for uh, not good. Uh, something's tampering with me. Uh, now, there's many. There's a number of ways to wire these. Um, you could wire the alarm into a separate security zone. So remember, on the uh, on the Omni panels, the you've got 16 security zones that you can wire into. It's expandable with expansion panels uh, up to many many zones. The but say uh, so you could wire the alarm into a separate zone and tamper into a separate zone. That has the advantage that you'd know exactly if there is a tamper, which device is being tampered with, and you can differentiate between just motion sensing and tamper. Or what most people do is wire it the way I've shown here, where you go in on alarm and out on tamper. Um, the advantage of that is that you use up less zones on the controller. The downside is, though, if a tamper occurs, well, you can't really differentiate between a tamper and motion. Um, a third option, of course, is to wire all the tampers together into one zone and have all of the alarms wired into separate zones. That uh, gives you separation between alarm and tamper, but um, you wouldn't know which zone was being tampered with. So you've got three options there. Most importantly, however, you do need to get your head around this end-of-line resistance concept. The... Um, the idea here is that um, I kind of I said it's open circuit when everything's okay. That's not strictly true. If that were true, there's nothing to stop someone just cutting the wires, and because that's also open circuit, and you wouldn't know if an alarm of a sensor has been removed. So actually, the reality is um, it's not open circuit for okay. It's 1k ohms. That's a thousand ohms resistance being offered. Uh, is okay and closed circuit for alarm. The idea there is that this, the actual circuit is supervised, it's monitored, so there's current continually running from the main panel through the PIR uh, in order to ensure it's still there and everything's okay. So in actual fact it's 1k ohms is everything's fine, closed circuit for when I have motion or tamper. So then if someone were to then cut the wires, we'd know about it. It'd go from 1k ohm up to open circuit with infinite ohms, and then the system would know there's a problem, and the zone would be shown as having trouble, um, which would then uh, alert the user by dialing out and, and making the bell box go off and the like. So uh, it's really important that you, with, uh, with the HAI system, you understand all detectors, motion sensors, door sensors, must offer 1,000 ohm re resistance. Now, most PIRs have this built in. You'll notice uh, down here there's jumpers on the left-hand side for alarm that show 1K, 2K, 4K, 5K, and 6K. And over here there's, tampers, uh, sorry, there's jumpers for tamper showing different impedances. These different impedances are used by different alarm systems. Our system requires 1K ohm. So you need to put the 1K ohm uh, jumper in place. Being as we've wired it through both alarm and tamper, we only want one of the jumpers in place, alarm or tamper, not both. If we put both in place, we're going to be offering 2K ohms. 
we only want to be offering 1k ohms. So in this case, I've got the jumper on the tamper side. doesn't really matter which side I put it on, because either way I'm offering 1k ohm resistance. If, of course, I've got my alarm and my tampers wired into separate zones, then, of course, I would need the 1k jumpers on both sides, because they're being, they're being pulled in as separate zones on the controller. So what, as long as you get your head around the 1k ohm resistance, that allows supervision of the sensor, uh, then, um, then you're okay. Uh, we can operate with any, any motion sensors. Um, some motion sensors come with the jumpers shown as we discussed. Some motion sensors have nothing built in. That's okay. Uh, with each HAI control panel, uh, they are shipped with 10 1k ohm resistors in the box. So you can then just hook up a 1k ohm resistor. Uh, keep the resistor inside the PIR, under the cover, uh, and that way you're still offering the 1k ohm resistance. And for really advanced users, um, you can, if you were to get into a situation, some PIRs may be uh, normally open, or sorry, 1k ohm for OK, and normally close for alarm, or there might be the other way around. Where it's 1k ohm for alarm and normally open and and uh, normally close for OK, we can handle both those scenarios uh, by either putting the 1k ohm resistor in series or parallel. That's all documented in the HAI Omni installation manual. Okay, so that's your PIRs, um, which uh, you can um, have lots and lots of them around the property. Also very, very, very important are door contacts. These, are, these don't require power. They are a little reed switch where you have um, two components. One's on the door frame, one's on the door, and they're magnetic. And when the door's closed, the magnet um, is pulling a little piece of metal up against two contacts to make a circuit, offering 1K ohm resistance. And when the door opens, the magnet is no longer uh, going to pull that piece of metal and a spring pushes it back. Um, so you then got um, the indication of whether or not it's uh, the doors closed or the doors open. Um, again, they've got two lots of screw down terminal blocks for tamper and alarm. Uh, and again, the simple way to wire these is as shown on the diagram, go in on tamper and out on alarm. Uh, only uses that one zone. Make sure your jumpers or your external resistors are set up uh, inside the uh, door sensor. Uh, with 1k ohm resistance for when the door is secure, the door is closed. So uh, they're uh, normally common to put one of these in the front door, one of these in the back door. Any doors that are on the ground floor where you've got entry exit points to the building should have a uh, should have a uh, door sensor of this nature. We also have a range of wireless sensors that can be incorporated into the system. The, uh, if you're going to use any of the wireless products, you do need to use the wireless 64 zone receiver uh, device. This wires into the HAI controller using four cores of a Cat5, and that wires into the same pins as the console wires. Um, two pins provide 12 volt power, and then you've got a pin for A and a pin for B. It runs on the internal RS485 bus of the system. So each of these sensors uh, will actually allow 64 wireless devices, so that's 64 wireless zones. And on a Omni Pro 2, you can have two of these devices. That gives you up to 128 wireless zones. You may choose on a large property to have two of these, perhaps for range reasons. If it, you know this is wireless, it uses a 400 megahertz uh, frequency, so it's quite good on range, but it does have a limit. So on a really big uh, property, you may have one on the east wing and one on the west wing uh, in order to make sure you've got good wireless coverage to uh, cover where the wireless sensors are. And it's only a Pro 2 that can support two sensors. The 2E and the lights will only support one. So bear that in mind when you're planning your, uh, your system. The range of um, types of sensors that we have um, quite comprehensive, starting from the top left. The top left is actually um, an interesting uh, uh, sensor. It allows you to actually measure um, tilt. You can, it's great for putting on a garage door. Um, it's got a little mercury switch in it, so when it's attached to the garage door, it's vertical. And then when the garage door opens, the up and over door makes it go horizontal, and that could then trigger it. 
Uh, it's also got a second use as well. It's um, inside you can wire into it um, a third party device. Let's say you've got a, a light beam sensor which um, perhaps has a contact closure when the light beam's broken but it's not wireless. You can wire that into the internal pins on this guy and therefore wireless enable a non wireless device to be able to trigger from. So that's a very useful little chap. Uh, we've also got a wireless motion sensor. Um, very, very easy to install. Obviously, any of these wireless products are because there's no wires. But with the PIR, you just screw it to the wall uh, via a little mounting assembly that comes with it. The next one is a recessed door sensor. Very popular because um, completely invisible when the door's closed. You do drill a hole in the door and drop the barrel into the door and then the magnet goes into the door frame. And when the door's closed, A, you can't see it and B, you can't get to it because you can't tamper with it. Um, and obviously that then tells you when the door's opened or closed. All of these devices, by the way, obviously have batteries in them. Uh, long life batteries, they last for years. Uh, and when the battery starts to get low, it does come up on the console or the touchscreen indicating that um, uh, battery is low for a particular sensor. So you can change the battery um, before uh, it dies. The next two are very similar. They are door, uh, window contacts or windows or door contacts. Um, there's two parts to uh, the, the vanishing one is simply a white chamfered uh, plastic that kind of blends in well with UPVC windows thus the name vanishing uh, it does come in two parts um, even though the picture only shows one 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 item uh, one part goes on the door frame one part goes on the door and then when the door opens they separate and it triggers uh, same for the wireless contact shown on the top right um, same concept it's just slightly slightly bigger and a bit more bulky um, but they both perform the same task so they're all the sort of sensors that you might use for your security, uh, for doors and, and PIRs. Moving down to the bottom row, we've got a driveway sensor, bottom left. This is quite interesting. This actually detects large metal objects moving in the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, so this is obviously designed for detecting cars. So you can put one of those guys on the uh, next to the driveway and if uh, as a car drives by then uh, it detects that the uh, that the car has uh, uh, driven past it which might trigger you to turn some driveway lights on or maybe make an announcement that there's a visitor in the driveway so you know there's somebody pulling in pulling in the drive. Uh, the, um, the next one is a brake glass detector this guy has basically got a, a microphone in it which is tuned to the sound of breaking glass so where you might have a, a large you know bay windows in a lounge you could put the wireless break glass detector on the opposite wall and if someone breaks glass when the alarm is armed then that will trigger if you do use one of these then do expect to have to buy a break glass tester which is um, a device that makes the sound of breaking glass so you can test it it's not too practical smashing bits of glass in your customers lounge uh, in order to make sure it works okay so just bear that in mind if you use a break glass detector the uh, that they're all really the main security uh, detectors um, also in the wireless portfolio we've got a four button wireless keypad uh, this um, keypad uh, can be is great for retrofit or if you just want to expand some more buttons maybe in the garage to turn some lights off and on but there's no cables out there you can put this keypad in place and you've got four buttons that are all pro programmable to do things um, it's actually got eight functions because you've got single button presses and you've got some two button combinations which gives you eight discrete functions it shows up as eight zones um, which you can then trigger off of to perform tasks. You've then got the uh, wireless four button key fob. Uh, this is very popular. Um, you can hang this obviously on your key ring and then looking at the symbols you can clearly see maybe the top left button might be when I'm leaving the house. You press that button it might arm the alarm in away mode. Um, turn your lights off, turn your music off, set the thermostats down to an away temperature. And then the next button is unlocking the house. When I come home, that might disarm the alarm, perhaps bring the temperature back to a normal temperature and maybe set up some lighting and maybe even turn the audio on. Um, and then you've got some other buttons at the bottom there that you can customize for your own customer's purposes. 
and then lastly you've got a panic button that's a, a wireless uh, panic button that um, it's a single button it comes with actually with a neck uh, a neck uh, a neck um, uh, necklace thing where you can hang it around your neck um, the uh, main application there is for care at home purposes if you've got an elderly uh, relative or a, an elderly person that um, sometimes HAI is used for care at home um, and if, if that person were to fall over they can press the button from their uh, neck holder and um, and that might then the system might dial out to the monitoring company um, who will then send a nurse round or something of that nature um, so that's the uh, purpose of that uh, wireless uh, single button that hangs on a pendant around your neck okay um, for the wireless for any of the wireless devices you do need to um, make them up with the wireless receiver um, the process for doing this is very straightforward on the wireless receiver on the right hand side just underneath the HAI logo you can snap that bottom bit off and there's two buttons under there uh, you need to put it in programming mode by pressing and holding the mode button um, that gets you into a programming setup then and it displays A1 uh, A1 is the, the number of the receiver so if you have two of them you set one to A1 and one to A2 press the mode button again and it displays N1 I'll come back to that in a minute press the button again and it displays a 1 which is address 1 and there'll be no dots at the bottom of the 1 so now you take your wireless transmitter, your door sensor, uh, make sure that the uh, battery is in place, you separate it and put it back together again. And then the one will flash and it will get two dots. And that now indicates that that sensor is mated up into address one. Press and hold the mode button to exit the, the uh, uh, setup mode. And now if you trigger the sensor by separating them again, you'll see the receiver flashing AL1, showing that alarm 1 is active. And you repeat that process for each transmitter, putting each uh, transmitter into a unique uh, address. Um, some devices come up with two dots, some devices come up with one dot. Uh, don't worry about that, don't change that, leave it as it is. Uh, basically two dots means it's a supervised device and there's keep alive messaging going on to make sure that the device is always in range whereas one dots the one dot devices are not supervised so if they go out of range it's okay the HAI control system doesn't complain obviously the what the uh, key fob is uh, unsupervised because you may well well you will put that on your key ring and go to work and that'll go out of range that's okay whereas the source of sensors that shouldn't ever be out of range like door contacts PIRs they are supervised and if uh, the system can't talk to them for more than two or three keep alives then it starts to complain and put messages up saying that it's got trouble with the back door sensor and so on um, so that's quite a useful uh, to useful to know that um, the N1 is a mode um, there's four different modes you can use um, one mode gives you 64 discrete zones with 64 different sensors um, a different mode allows you to have 16 zones with four sensors per zone and then you've got some other modes with a combination thereof so um, that's uh, it's all well documented one thing that's very good about the HAI products is um, there's a really good data sheet comes with every single product uh, and the different N1 to N4 modes are documented in the uh, wireless receiver data sheet internal and external sounders are uh, essential for any intruder alarm system uh, you need at least one bell box on the outside of the house and ideally a uh, an internal sounder inside the house as well so it's very clear and very loud and you may even have multiple sounders in a very large property we uh, with the HAI intruder alarm system it's 12 volt applied so it applies 12 volts when we want the alarm bell sound bell to sound um, different systems on the marketplace vary we're 12 volt applied 
Wiring these things in uh, is uh, what for the external sounder is shown below. That uh, can be a bit tricky because external sounders have got a brain of their own and their own battery backup and they can start doing stuff of their own volition if you're not too sure what's going on. So within our bell box, different bell boxes will vary, but the one we supply um, has these screw down terminals here. Starting at the bottom, you've got a permanent 12 volt power supply. Um, again, we've got 12 volts off the main HAI controller on the 12 volt auxiliary output, so you wire that straight into there. And that's a constant 12 volt power supply. The HAI system is battery backed up. So even in a power failure, we're still delivering 12 volts to the alarm bell box. That charges the battery inside the bell box. And if that 12 volts is cut, then the bell box thinks it's being attacked and the sounder will sound using its own internal battery. Um, next, we've got a bell and strobe pins. Uh, we want both the bell and the strobe to go off when the alarm is sounding so we can wire uh, into both of those pins up onto the main HAI panel. Uh, it's labelled, uh, it's in the upper layer of screw down terminals and it's labelled, as you can see, horn. Uh, you've got an int, ground and ext. So we're using the external sounder. Uh, we wire this strobe and bell into the external sounder pin. Now, uh, this is a supervised circuit again, because uh, obviously if that wire is cut, then that disables our ability to make the bell box go off. So that's a supervised circuit. There's continual current running through there, down and returning back through the minus on the 12 volt to ensure the bell box, um, tr you know, 12 volt applied cable is intact. Um, in order for that to work, there is a residual 2 or 3 volts running through there. To make that work fine, we need a 1k ohm resistor, as shown at the top of the page, between the ground and the external pin. Um, again, there's 10 1k ohm resistors in the box, so one of those resistors is fine. That then gets the voltage just right, so that we've got 2 or 3 volts running through the system, uh, permanently to supervise it, and 12 volts when we want it to go off. So don't forget that resistor. Otherwise, uh, your bell box will sound continuously, even when we don't want it to. Uh, next, we have the tampers at the top here. The bell box itself has a tamper on the cover when you lift the cover up. And it also has a tamper on the back of the bell box. So if you rip it off the wall, the tamper is triggered. We can wire that into one of our tamper zones on the uh, one of our 16 zones on the main controller main board. This, uh, obviously, as discussed, requires 1K end-of-line resistance. Um, we don't have any resistance being offered from the, from the bell box, so we need to use one of our 1K ohm resistors in here. Make sure you fit that inside the bell box, because obviously if someone cuts the wire, we need, that will then go from 1K ohms to infinite ohms, and then we'll know about it, and um, these... HAI system will go into an alarm state. So that's how you wire in the uh, the uh, the external sounder. Very importantly as well is our dial-up facilities because um, when the alarm's going off, we need to dial out and tell the customer. There is a built-in dialer built into the Omni panel. The um, HAI panel comes with a little junction box which is what we're looking at here um, the junction box allows you to wire in the telephone incoming telephone line so I've got the telephone master socket shown there and we wire that into the lower two pins on the red and the green um, and what happens is the telephone then goes out through the RJ45, you, as well as the junction box, you have a cable with an RJ45 shown at the top, which goes up and there's some little spade connectors that connect onto the HAI panel. There's four pins it connects to on the top right, um, the upper screw down terminal box row on the right hand side. So what happens here is the telephone line actually goes through the HAI panel and then comes out again from the red and green contacts on that junction box at the top and then you can go off around your house slave telephone sockets. The idea here is if you are on the phone talking to somebody and the system needs to dial out, 
then it can cut you off, seize the line, and then dial out to warn someone that uh, the alarm's going off or call the monitoring company. So it's called seizing the line. Um, so that's why uh, we wire it in this manner. Fairly straightforward. Uh, again, well documented in the, in the installation manuals and the junction box and cable to connect to the control panels provided in the box. Alternatively, what's very popular and what most people use is our GSM dialer. Um, the GSM dialer allows you to really give the HAI system its own dedicated phone line, so it's not having to share the house line. This has a number of advantages, uh, one of which is when it's dialing out, you know it's the alarm system calling you because you've got a unique phone number for it. And, you know, with, with uh, modern smartphones, you can, you know, put in a different ringtone and stuff like that so when you know it's the alarm system calling you rather than the, uh, the, 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 the domestic landline from the property calling you. And of course um, it's far more secure because uh, a potential intruder by cutting the phone wires on the outside of the building are not going to cut off the ability for the system to dial out and warn somebody. So um, it's very, uh, uh, very robust. Uh, two, two modes of operation for this. Uh, you can either use it as your primary mechanism for dialing out, which is shown on the left-hand side. You can see that the um, HAI controller is wired into the C3 GSM dialer that dials out via the GSM cellular network to call either the central monitoring station or a landline or your mobile or all of the above. The other option is to use it as a backup mechanism for the landline. So therefore you're using the landline as your primary mechanism for dialing out, but should the landline fail, then it'll use the GSM as the backup. Uh, but then you're back into not knowing if it's using the landline, not knowing whether it's your house line or your or your um, GSM dialer uh, that, that, that's calling you. So. Um, it's uh, predominantly the left-hand diagram that most people use. The, uh, the C3 uh, GSM dialer is battery backed up, so it's got its own battery built into it um, so that it will continue to operate in a power failure that should a, 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 an intruder cut the power to the house. Um, your HAI controller is battery backed up, your GSM dialer is battery backed up. Um, all of your um, sensors are getting the power from the main controller uh, or they're wireless with their own batteries so your intruder system is still going to work even in a complete power failure scenario. You do need to put a SIM card in it in order for it to dial out. Uh, don't use um, pay-as-you-go SIM cards because they expire after three months of not being used and then you leave yourself vulnerable to not knowing if your uh, alarm system can dial out or not so get a proper sim card you can normally get a second sim card on your mobile phone tariff relatively inexpensively um, and then you've got peace of mind that it can it can dial out so in this case um, using it as your primary dial out mechanism you can see the back of the uh, c3 here um, it's got a phone connection and you wire from there onto your two pins for the incoming you know, if you want to test it, um, you could wire a phone, a domestic phone, off of the upper pins. And when you pick up this test phone, it will then allow you to get a dial tone you can dial out using GSM. Or perhaps your customer wants an emergency phone where they can dial out uh, if their landline fails. Um, so you could employ that as a mechanism. Uh, but primarily when the HAI system needs to dial out, it can do so via the, via the C3. If you're using the C3 as a backup to the PSTN, the, 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 uh, the main landline, then you go from your BT master or your master socket into the, the, into the socket labeled PSTN and then from phone into the HAI system. Now what will happen is you'll dial out using the landline and you'll only dial out on GSM if the landline fails. Um, but if you're using a C3, uh, most people would be using the G using it for GSM for primary dial out as per the previous chart. Just at this point, I'd like to hop into PC access to show you some of the settings that we need to set up for the security side of things using the PC access software. 
um, as you're probably from familiar from the previous module um, we have a setup tab in PC access where we set all of our functions up for programming the system codes are on the is the first item this is where you will set up all of your users for the alarm system so uh, you can give every user a unique code mum gets a code dad gets a code all the individual children get a separate code the cleaner gets a code that way everything's logged when you arm and disarm the alarm so all activities are logged and you know who's done who's done what in the event of something going wrong you can look back in the log to give everyone an individual code the first code's always a master code that's locked down uh, there's always be one master code every other code can either be a user or a manager uh, the difference between the two there is that's really down to the dial-in facilities where uh, you can actually dial into an HAI system and you have a menu where you can actually activate functions for lighting, heating, security. Um, users don't have those functions but masters and managers do. Uh, again you can refer to the, uh, to the manual for more detail on the authority uh, of each user. Uh, you can also restrict users down to certain time zones uh, as to when they can use their code. Um, a cleaner, for example, their code may only work on a Tuesday between 9 and 5, because that's the day the cleaner comes, disarm the alarm to come and clean. Uh, their code will not work at the weekends. So that's quite a nice feature, being able to lock codes down for uh, third-party you know, contractors and so on, um, that they can only access the, the house at certain times of day. So give each user a separate code. Uh, under dialing, this is where we tell the system whether or not it has dial-out facilities to be able to dial out. So you have a yes on the telephone access. I've got no in this case for this particular example. Um, but also you specify uh, if it has got telephone access, whether or not the system can answer incoming calls and therefore give you access to the, um, the menu system to be able to uh, activate functions via a touchtone phone. Uh, if it is going to answer calls, how many rings before answering? Obviously, if you are using the landline, be careful how you set this up because obviously on the landline, they may well have an answer phone and then you get into a race condition between who answers the phone does the HAI system answer the phone or the answer phone so be careful of that that's where using the C3 and having a separate phone number for the HAI system makes life a lot easier and then down here you can list all of your phone numbers that you want the system to dial out on you can list up to eight phone numbers um, and in the dialing order you then list which order you want them to call out so if I had if I had the first four numbers populated, I might put one, two, three, four, and it will call them in that order. One, two, three, four. I've only got one phone number in my system, so I've only got a one there. Uh, it will call all the numbers. So if you have eight numbers in there and the alarm goes off, all eight numbers will get called one at a time um, until it can hear a voice and leave and speak to that person. Um, so bear that in mind. You can also specify. The time frame, so if you've got a friendly neighbor who's going to be a key holder for you, but you don't really want to call them at 3 in the morning, um, you might specify for that neighbor that you can only call them between, say, 8 a.m. and 10 p.m. at night, and they don't get called in the middle of the night because that might upset them. So that's where you can set up all the dialing parameters. Areas is quite, uh, quite a nice feature. Areas allows you to actually set up like virtual alarm systems so in my example here I've got a main house and a pool house um, and I would like to when I come home and disarm the main house alarm uh, I don't want to disarm the pool complex which is at the end of my garden where I've got a pool and a gym and a and a, and a pool house for example I want to keep my the alarm system uh, in there active and, and live even when I disarm the alarm on the house so by doing this I can add the pool house as a separate area and what I can do is arm and disarm the alarm in these different areas independently of each other which is a really nice feature uh, on the Omni Pro 2 I can have up to eight areas that's eight virtual alarm systems on a 2E I only have two and the light I only have the one so um, nice feature great if you've got outbuildings a workshop 
garage, uh, like I said, the pool complex uh, example, then that allows you to basically set up a, uh, an alarm in each area. Uh, and if I move on to arming, arming is attributes about how the alarm system behaves. Um, and you'll notice I've now got two columns, one for main house and one for pool house. So not only can I arm and disarm the alarm in these different areas independently, I can also customize them independently. So examples at the top here, I've got my entry delay. So this is when I, when the alarm is active and I've come in the front door and I dis and the, the front door's triggered, the alarm starts beeping at me. I've got a 30 second entry delay is how this has been set up here. I've got 30 seconds to enter my code to turn the alarm off before the bells start going off. Likewise, I've got an exit delay when I enter my code in my alarm panel then I've got 30 seconds it starts beeping I've got 30 seconds to exit the building before the alarms fully armed and that's customizable uh, per area as you can see and there's a few other attributes in here um, I've got chimes that I can turn off and on so on an entry exit zone every time a front door opens and closes it will chime when the alarm's not active um, that's for useful in, in commercial and shops just to let know someone's coming for the door you probably turn it off in a domestic environment and perimeter is for doors uh, for windows beg your pardon entry exits for doors perimeters for windows you probably turn those off in uh, in um, uh, a domestic scenario Coming down to zones, this is very important. This is where uh, I specify the behavior of each zone, where I might have PIRs or door contacts. Um, there's quite a lot of different zone types that I need to get my head around um, for setting the system up. Fortunately, there's only a handful that you're gonna use, and fortunately, HAI have documented this in their help menus um, if you go to the help uh, as I've just done there you'll notice the setup kind of mirrors the setup under PC access tab under the setup tab which makes life quite a lot easier um, so if so I'm in the zones so if I go to zones I've then got zone type now this now tells me all about the different zone types and the main ones you're going to use are the ones listed at the top so entry exit that's for your doors that you will enter and exit the building from if you trip one of these zones then it will trigger the entry exit delays so you want to set up any door sensors for any entry exit points as entry exit perimeter you use that for any windows any any um, way that was well, someone shouldn't be entering and exiting the building you set up as a perimeter when these trip when the alarm is set the alarm will go off straight away there's no entry exit timer night interior and away interior is for your motion sensors just a quick uh, summary of how you arm the alarm on the HAI Omni system on the console the keypad you can arm the alarm in away mode night mode day mode and off it's obviously turning the alarm off in away mode, everything's active. You've left the house, the house is empty. In night mode, you're obviously upstairs in bed. Um, so you want everything active apart from the PIRs upstairs. Um, so we need to differentiate between the PIRs upstairs and downstairs. That's where this comes in. So night interior is for motion detectors in areas where no one should be while you're sleeping in your home. Uh, for example, uh, in a two-story building, then that will be for your downstairs motion detectors. And away interior is where no one should be whilst you're away. So uh, in the previous example, that will be for your upstairs PIRs. So downstairs PIRs set them up as night interior, and upstairs PIRs set them up as away interior. And... Further down the list, I've got my panic and tampers. So any tamper circuits and any panic buttons, I set them up as tamper or panic in the zone types. So that's the zone types you're going to use. Entry exits for your doors, perimeters for your windows, night interiors for your PIRs downstairs, away interior for your PIRs upstairs, panic for any panic buttons, and tamper for any tamper circuits. They are the main zone types that you will use. 
Um, there are a lot more zone types that you can play with for fire, for gas, for freeze, water, all sorts of useful different uh, types of zones. And basically when the system, when the alarm goes off and the HAI system rings you up, it actually tells you, you know, gas watch, uh, the gas alert zone has triggered so you know what it is. It speaks to you over the phone and tells you the freeze watch detector in the basement's gone off or the motion sensor in the bedroom's gone off. So by you know setting these zone types up properly, you get a lot more information uh, and you do affect the behavior because obviously entry exits trigger the entry exit timer. Panics and tampers, whenever they trigger, even if the alarm isn't armed, the system will go off. So there's, getting the zone types right is quite important. Just to finish off arming the alarm, I meant I went through the uh, night, uh, day, uh, the night and away modes. I didn't mention the day mode. If you arm the alarm in day mode, it's really for when you're in the house, but you want to feel secure. So all your entry, exit, and perimeter zones are active, but none of your motion sensors are. So you can move around in the house comfortably without triggering anything off. But if a door or window opens, then the alarm will go off. So that's what day mode's for couple of little things to be aware of um, when you arm the alarm the uh, all zones must be secure that's a way of testing all of the zone types uh, testing all the zones rather to make sure they are all secure so if you try and arm the alarm and a windows in the bedrooms open then on the console it will say you know bedroom window not ready and you can press hash to retry or you can bypass it and just ignore it or you can do the sensible thing go upstairs and close the window uh, and then you can come back and arm the alarm because all zones are secure one thing that does catch people out is uh, maybe they're at the front door and the front door's open because uh, the kids have run out to go and get in the car um, you do need to close the front door to arm the alarm so that it can see all zones are secure and working correctly then you into the exit delay, then you open the door and leave the building and close the door. During the course of that activity, the HAI system has seen an entry exit zone trigger um, during the exit delay, so it knows you've left the building. If you arm the alarm in away mode and you do not trigger an entry exit delay, the alarm will know you're still in the building and it will revert to day mode instead of away mode. You can override that function if you want with this feature here, unvacated premises. By default, that's set to yes. If you set that to no, uh, as I've done here, that will allow you to exit the building um, or arm the alarm without triggering an entry exit zone. Uh, of course, with the iPhone app, you know you can walk out the door, close the close the door, lock the door up, and then from the car, run up the iPhone app and arm the alarm in away mode if you want to. That's not a problem. The other thing that catches people out is the fact that all zones must be secure when you arm the alarm. If you have a PIR overlooking the front door where you would be standing to arm the alarm using the console, you may well be triggering that PIR when you're standing there. So um, if, you, if you end up in that scenario, you kind of need to stand very still and just press the hash key to retry um, when the PIR is not picking up motion to be able to arm the alarm. That's not a great place to be. So when you're planning and designing your system, make sure your PIRs are not covering the area where you would stand to operate the console to arm the alarm. The front door should be protected properly via a door contact. Um, so you can have your PIR covering the hallway, leaving a dark spot where you'd stand to arm the alarm at the console, knowing that the front door is still covered by the fact you've got a door contact there. So watch out for that one. That's caught a few people out. So uh, that's the, um, the main things you need to do to set up the, uh, the security system. Um, obviously, there's a few more attributes against some of those different items um, that's all well documented in the uh, user manual. I will just go back to zones because I wanted to highlight the fact that the area um, is listed here. So in order to associate a zone with an area, uh, after you've set the zone type up, 
you then set up the area type um, that then allocates that zone to that area so that's quite an important one um, cross zoning is uh, if you have multiple security sensors uh, if you want to group them together then if if one sensor goes off it doesn't trigger an alarm unless both of them go off um, that kind of gives you that um, sort of double effect so that when if to have a real alarm both sensors might need to go off so maybe a door sensor and a motion sensor both have to trigger within 60 seconds in order to make it a real alert swing a shutdown is um, where you might, might have as you, if you enable that then it will automatically shut that zone down if it triggers the alarm off more than two times uh, the idea is you've got a, a, a window or a door swinging in the wind and it keeps triggering the alarm off so if the alarm goes off multiple times as a result of that when it resets on a second time it will disable that zone if you've enabled swing a shutdown uh, dial out delay enables you to, uh, to, to, to delay dial out on a per zone basis that uh, if you're dialing out to a monitoring company you've accidentally triggered a sensor you might want to delay the dial out by 10 seconds that gives you enough time to disable the alarm if it was accidentally triggered so you don't you know, end up calling the alarm monitoring company where you see these DCM codes don't mess around with those they are standard codes that's what's used with alarm monitoring companies so if your system is being monitored by group 4 security it'll uh, send those um, those codes out to the monitoring company so do uh, don't mess around with those if you are wanting to set up group for uh, third-party monitoring let us know and we can help you out with that well we've covered um, most of the aspects of setting up an Omni um, as an alarm system um, I hope you found this module useful there are um, lots of uh, other information available to you on our website and on the HAI website and uh, of course there's lots of other modules available to you um, uh, from this website uh, in this HAI training curriculum so I hope you found it useful any questions uh, you can email us at sales at order systems dot co dot uk um, or you can call us on 01296 719 582 um, and of course our website is www.aldersystems.co.uk Thank you very much and I hope you uh, tune into the next training module.